our Father in heaven, we thank you that near to your heart we can safely gather and that close to you there is no other refuge that we can find, no better safety that you afford. Lord, we pray that you would nurture our faith and trust in you, that you would come and you would provide comfort for everyone in this place, everyone listening and watching wherever they are, whatever burdens we have, whatever struggles, that you would show yourself to be a kind, loving, comforting, gracious, tender, strong, mighty, all-knowing, all-providing Father. Teach us by your Son and your Spirit through your Word now how to pray, what to pray, that we may someday, perhaps even years from now, look back and say 2021 was a year where by your grace you taught us all much in prayer. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We come now to the Lord's Prayer itself in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Most of us are probably so familiar with these words that we rarely stop to think what an amazing thing it is that we even have this prayer. What if you had the opportunity to ask the greatest coach of all time, teach me how to shoot a basketball, or you ask the greatest chef, teach me how to cook, or the greatest plumber, teach me how to stop this leaky toilet, you would be on the edge of your seat Maybe your toilet seat, I didn't mean it that way, but you would be on the edge of your seat ready to hear what they had to say and then to put their advice and their example into practice and how much more should we be ready and eager to hear from Jesus for he is much more than just an expert in prayer and prayer is infinitely more important than any hobby or skill or vocation. Prayer is absolutely indispensable for the Christian. We cannot live without it, not as a Christian. A couple weeks ago, I was visiting an out-of-town friend, and when I got there to my friend's house, to my surprise, he was visiting with someone else, and the man that he was visiting with happened to be an astronaut. Yes, my friend has very interesting people visit him. He was a real, live astronaut who uh, was a Christian man, very humble, talking very matter-of-factly and humbly about the many trips he had made to outer space. And in fact, he was telling about what he's studying now is trying to develop the right sort of testing to determine whether or not future astronauts have the right sort of temperament or personality mix to endure months or even a year alone in space. How do you tell if you're the right sort of person who can do that without cracking when you're just alone in space for 12 months? I thought, I'll tell you, that's not me. <laughs> I don't think that's many of us. But as I was listening there, sitting there listening to him, trying to get my head around what this man has done for a living, and I gathered that he has built space stations. And he said, well, I haven't been up in space for, you know, months, but just, just weeks, you know, at a time. Oh, that seems rather interesting. And as I was thinking about this sermon, imagine you were going to live at the space station for six months. And before you blast it off into space... The astronaut training you said, now, one last thing, when you breathe up there, here's how you do it. I'd be, okay, hold, could you put this into my phone? Could I write this down? This seems like something that's pretty important as I go to live in space for six months. Tell me, how do I breathe? You'd be pretty interested 
in knowing what he had to say. There aren't many things more important than knowing how you breathe. You don't live without it. Well, in the Christian life, there aren't many things more important than knowing how to pray. And how blessed we are that Jesus has left for us for all time this prayer. He could have just told us, pray. We could have just seen him pray, but he says very explicitly, here, in fact, is the model. Here is how I want you to pray. What could be more important than that? The church father Cyprian said, what praying to the father can be more truthful than that which was delivered to us by the son who is the truth out of his own mouth? Luther called the Lord's Prayer the very best prayer that ever came to earth or that anyone would ever have thought up. And Calvin, pointing to the privilege of saying the Lord's Prayer, said, because in it, the only begotten Son of God supplies words to our lips that free our minds from all wavering. You don't have to wonder when you pray this prayer or when you pray according to this prayer if you're praying what God wants to hear or what pleases Him, or what is fruitful and profitable, you know it from Jesus Himself. I've mentioned before that one of the earliest documents, maybe the earliest document we have from the church outside of the biblical text is something called the Didache, which is just Greek for the teaching. It's sort of like an early church manual of instruction, kind of constitution, and in this, it encourages the Christians, tells them that they ought to pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day. If you hear this morning, you hear echoes of the synagogue practice, and very likely that the early Christians were drawing from that practice in the synagogue, and they said, okay, now we are going to pray this Lord's Prayer three times a day. Now, if you know your Bible, you know there's nothing in the Bible that tells you to do that, and in fact, you can see the danger that if we did in a very robotic way pray this three times a day, you could be guilty of the sort of vain repetitions that Jesus warned against in Matthew 6. But the exhortation in the Didache tells us just how important the Lord's Prayer was from the, various earliest, the earliest days of the church. They understood those who were closest to the generation of the apostles that this was not just another prayer. It is, in fact, the prayer that teaches us how to pray every other prayer. Now, obviously, we don't have to include or spew out these exact words. That's not what Jesus means, that this is the only thing you can say, and you must say this verbatim. It's not a rigid formula. And yet, every Christian prayer should be informed by and shaped by the Lord's Prayer. It's not that you have to have your prayer start in exactly the same way. We see other prayers in the Bible that start in different ways, or you have to cover these set of petitions, but rather this is our model. And what we find here should have a profound shaping effect on what we pray for and, even before that, the knowledge of to whom we are praying. So look in your Bible here at the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. You can see it has a simple structure. There is an opening address, which we'll look at, followed by six petitions. And we'll look at the first petition tonight. It's important to realize these statements are not ascriptions. That is, they are not ascribing something to God. An ascription says, your name is holy, your kingdom is is coming. That is a declarative statement. These are not ascriptions, but petitions. They're asking God to do something. The first set of three requests focus on God's glory, His name, His kingdom, His will. The second set of three requests focus on our good, our provision, our forgiveness, our protection. And of course, the two sets cannot be separated. God is glorified as He gives us what we need, and when we ask for what we need, we always do it with an eye to God receiving glory. But that is a helpful way to think of 
these two sets of three petitions, God's glory and our good. Following the six petitions, there is, in our traditional recitation of the prayer, a concluding ascription. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. If you're looking in your Bible, if you don't have a King James Bible, you won't find that ascription because earlier and better manuscripts don't have that. And so all of the, the most recent English translations do not include that. Does that mean we're wrong to say that when we, pray? Well, when we pray? No. We will come to that in the last sermon and show how it's filled with biblical ideas and actually the imagery and the language of the prayer itself can be traced back to the Old Testament. So there's nothing wrong with praying it, but we ought to realize that it's most likely not part of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught His disciples to pray. Our plan for this evening is very simple. We're going to move through this opening address and then into the opening petition phrase by phrase. So look at verse 9, pray then like this. You notice in your English Bible, the first word is our, but the first word in Greek is pater, father. Sometimes you'll hear the Lord's Prayer called by the first two words in the Latin version of the prayer, and especially you'll hear in sometimes Catholic tradition calling it the pater noster, pater, father, noster, our. Interestingly, and this perhaps doesn't have anything to do, but it comes to mind, you you may know there's an old type of elevator called a pater noster. You can look it up later. It's mostly in Europe. And uh, when I was doing some of my studies in the UK, in one of the buildings that I had to go to, it had one of the last working paternosters in the UK. It was very mm, scary but interesting. And it's an elevator that doesn't have a door, it doesn't close, it just has a wooden platform and you can fit one person there at a time and it just goes on a very rudimentary sort of pulley system up and around the building. And depending on who you ask, it's called a paternoster because if you could look at it, it would look like the beads of the rosary. Or I was told it's called the paternoster because every time you stepped on that, you wanted to say a prayer to step on and step off it because you sort of look at when you're going to jump on your elevator because it doesn't stop. It just keeps moving. And then when you get to your floor, you just jump off. No buttons to push, just a pulley that keeps moving. Sadly, they have done away with it. I don't know why that it's just a a great, dangerous fire hazard, people crushing elevator waiting to happen. But verse 9 is not about elevators, even if the speech is elevated. No, we have at the very beginning this first word, Father. Now think about that. Jesus wants us to call the God of the universe... The God who made the world out of nothing. The God who calls all of the trillions of stars out by name. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of the ten plagues and the parting of the Red Sea. The God of the glory cloud filling the tabernacle. The God who shakes the cedars of Lebanon. The God who showed himself to Daniel as the ancient of days. The God before whom no one can stand face to face and live Jesus wants us to call this God Father. To pray with intimacy to God, Abba, Father, here, Pater, Father, is not a human right, it is a spiritual privilege. It is a privilege for the people of God who have been born again by the Spirit of God. John 1. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. It is not our natural human birthright to call God Father. It is our born-again spiritual birthright. Now, granted, there is a sense in which you could say God is Father over all, in that he has created all people, Acts 17, we are his offspring, and so everyone owes their existence to God. In that grand sense, I suppose you could call him the father of all. But that's not how Jesus speaks of the fatherhood of God. 
It's the old liberal argument that asserts the universal fatherhood of God, or as they used to say about the Unitarian Church, the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, and the neighborhood of Boston. That's about what it amounted to. But he is not the universal father of all people. One book I was reading in my study this week, a more liberal book, said that obviously Jesus means that God is the father of all. And then the author goes on not to cite a single Bible verse, but instead to quote from Rudolf Bultmann to argue that God is the father of all. But it's actually quite the opposite. We see Jesus make the point that to call God Father is not the right of everyone by being born, but is a special spiritual right for those who have been adopted as sons and daughters. There is no biblical warrant for thinking that God is Father to all and we are all His children. So recognize that this is a unique address that God gives to us. Only disciples get to call God Father. Even in the Old Testament where the fatherhood of God is less clear than in the New Testament, we see this intimate relationship of a father and his children is the special privilege reserved for God's people. And what is there in seed form in the Old Testament is here in full bloom in the New. Fifteen times the Old Testament uses father in this religious sense of God. But in the New Testament, it's used 245 times. Just there occasionally in the Old Testament, now central idea in the New Testament, that by God's initiative, we can approach God as our Father. 1 John 3, 1, behold what manner of love the Father hath given unto us that we should be called the sons of God. And incidentally, but importantly, we do not have justification for calling God mother for substituting mother. Isn't that just an an equally fine address? Some of the books I read argue for that as well. Well, the important part is that he's a parent, and perhaps mother means something more to you. Now, listen, it is very true. The Bible, on a few occasions, describes God with maternal characteristics. He's tender like a nursing mother or like a, a chicken brooding over her young. And so, we don't have to be embarrassed to use those sort of images, but that's not the same as naming God as mother. God is spirit. He doesn't have a body, so He doesn't have a gender. He's not male or female, and yet, consistently, exclusively throughout Scripture, He reveals Himself as a king, a husband, and a father, not as a queen, a wife, or a mother. We have no warrant to pray for God in ways that we may simply think sound better, are more culturally attuned, or more appropriate. Think about it. The act of naming is an inherent act of authority. That's why God named Adam. Adam was given to name the animals, later to name Eve. Moses with the burning bush, what shall I say when people ask who sent me? And God provides his own name. To name is an act of authority. And so, it would be an act of great presumption for us to think that we could give God a new identity and a new name. It would usurp his own divine prerogative to reveal himself as he chooses to reveal himself. Of course, I hope I don't have to add, but I will here, that it's nothing about any superiority of men over women. It is simply the way in which God has chosen to reveal Himself with masculine pronouns and these masculine titles. To call on God as Father is a gift of the triune God. You may see, well, where is the Trinity here? It's all about our Father. But if you think about it, and you know the rest of the New Testament, you know that even the act of speaking truly from your heart, the fatherhood of God, is a Trinitarian act. Romans 8 tells us it is the Spirit of God who testifies to our spirit that we are children and co-heirs with Christ and therefore causes us to cry out, Abba, 
Father. So if you, from your heart, truly cry out to God as Father, that is evidence that you have Christ as your brother and that the Spirit is at work. It is always in addressing God in this way, truly from our heart, an act of Trinitarian faith and operation. The biggest indicator of Christian prayer, what makes it Christian, because lots of people pray. Most people in this country would admit, would acknowledge that they pray. What makes it Christian prayer is not the geographic direction in which we pray or the body position while we pray or even what we may experience while we pray. What makes it Christian prayer is, first of all, an awareness of the one to whom we pray. We talked about this this morning. God doesn't need or delight in the mere repetition of words and phrases. What He delights is when His children speak to Him to know that we love Him, to know that we confide in Him, to know that we're confident that He cares for us, that we believe that we can come to Him with all of our needs, that we know that He can do anything for us. As much as we are imperfect parents, as much as I am an imperfect father, and I am very much, yet when my kids want to tell me something, I'm, and here I'll put the parentheses, usually, I'm usually happy to hear from them, and I'm especially happy when they come and I can tell that it's in a very sincere, serious moment and they have a a genuine question, they have some burden, they have something that they want to tell me. One of my kids yesterday was watching TV and he was watching a Transformers cartoon and he informed me, Dad, this is Transformers. I said, okay, I can see that. Um, This is the second season. I said, okay. He said, it's the one where Optimus Prime has a girlfriend. I said, oh boy, what is happening to our world? Call me old-fashioned, but Optimus Prime doesn't need a girlfriend. He said, I know, Dad, it's weird. Now, if, if I'm, as a sinful father, happy to hear from my kids when they want to share what they are watching on TV, what they are thinking in their heads, how much more does our God in heaven delight to hear from us? You know what we need when we pray? We need less awareness of ourselves, and we need more awareness of God. Isn't that really hard to do? Whether you're praying with other people or you're even by yourself sometimes, you're, you're very almost out of body. You're, you're aware, well, what am I saying? What am I doing? What does it sound like? Am I praying? Am I doing a good job praying? That doesn't make for good communication, for heartfelt petition. Less focus on how you are, and what are you doing, and is this working right, and are you praying very well? Did you just get distracted? And more focus on the one to whom we are praying. What I have to come back to when I pray, because I get very distracted and wander about and don't feel like I'm very good at it, I have to remind myself of this simple fact. Someone is there. Someone is listening, and not just anyone but my Father. I'm not just giving a a short spiritual soliloquy, not just going through a ritual for the day or something that is important to do before I go to work. I am speaking to my Father. Remember who you are talking to in prayer. Jesus puts this with the very first word of His instruction into the most intimate family terms. You see, it's not so much about proper protocol, but rather that if we know to whom we are talking, then the right approach and the right protocols will follow. So, he's not your roommate, he's not your butler, he's not your girlfriend, so you don't come to God real chummy, you don't demand him to wait on you, you don't come with a 
kind of romantic ethos, but neither do we pray to him as a dictator or a parole officer or some harsh taskmaster. So we just have to plead with him against his better judgment to listen to us. No, you don't have to grovel or squirm or be afraid. You come to him as a child, comforted that your father loves you, confident that he wants to hear from you. Our father. The first word in English is our. And so I just said we ought to be confident that he wants to hear from you, but I maybe should have said confident that he wants to hear from us because the first word we recite in the prayer is the plural, our. Now, we should pray this by ourselves too, and this is a model for us whenever we pray. Earlier in the chapter, Jesus talked about closing your door and praying there in private. So Jesus anticipates we're going to have private prayer. He models that often in the Scriptures. But it's striking that there is no first-person singular pronoun in this prayer. This is the model for all our praying. Even when we are praying alone, there is a sense in which we are praying with the larger body of Christ. It's never just you praying. But I don't think that's mainly what Jesus has in mind. The most important takeaway from our is the assumption that prayer is a corporate event. Now, that may be harder for us, even though we can get places faster, we live farther apart and we live lives that are more isolated than they would have lived in a close-knit, smaller community in the ancient world. Unless you live in a very tight-knit neighborhood or you live in a dorm at a Christian college, most of us aren't gathering in small groups to pray every day. And yet, wouldn't it be easier to be faithful in prayer if you weren't doing it alone? It does count, you know, if you're with other people. It's a good reason to pray as a husband and wife, to have family worship around the dinner table or whatever you can make time for a few minutes, or to join a small group, or to gather with other believers at work, or to think about how we can foster the sort of community at church where we're coming to pray together. We should hear prayer and think, ah, that's what I get to do with the family of God on a regular basis. Jesus assumes that the prayer the disciples will pray will be with other Christians. And he also probably assumed that much of what they would pray would be through familiar forms of prayer. Most of us in, in evangelical tradition assume that real prayer is more or less extemporaneous or spontaneous. And there is something that's really important about being able to, to pray in your own words. But let's not neglect, neglect the riches that God has given us to use different forms, whether you may pray through a confession or the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, or many of you probably have used the Valley of Vision, a book of Puritan prayers. There are so many resources. We heard this morning how Jesus and his disciples almost certainly were familiar with the 18 benedictions and could have recited them. When Jesus, in his moment of greatest trial on the cross, what came out of his mouth? But Scripture utterances and Scripture prayers. When they went out to sing prayers on that night, they sang the Hallel Psalms. When Jonah was in the belly of a whale, have you ever noticed that almost every line of that prayer comes from the Scriptures? So don't be afraid as we pray together to pray with freedom and to pray with forms. Our Father, who art in heaven. It's precious to talk to one's Father, but the amazing thing about Jesus' prayer is that our Father is in heaven. The amazement goes in both directions, doesn't it? You could think, God is my Father. And you can also think, my Father is God. If you have the privilege of Growing up in a fairly decent household, many kids go through a phase. I hope my kids went through it. I can't say that they're all still in it, where they think that their dad can do anything. My dad's so strong, and my dad's so tall, and my dad's so smart, and my dad's so skinny. Maybe they say that. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. 
And kids often instinctively have a time where they think that about their, their fathers. My father can do anything. Uh, months ago, I did one of the online tests for Jeopardy. I never got my call to go and test out and then get on the show. I'll probably, once the year is up and you can do it, I'll probably do it again. It is one of the, the standard practices in our home that at 7 o'clock, Jeopardy is on. And usually when we're cleaning up from dinner, we can catch some of it while I'm holding a, a child or two. And my dear children, when I told them that I was taking the Jeopardy test, they were already thinking of what they were going to do with the grand winnings that would come our way. Because surely I would do well on the test, they thought, and I would get the call, and I would go on there. I told them, look, if I just make it on there, I promise you, I'll take you to Great Wolf Lodge, okay, if we just make it on there. So they're planning on that. They're planning on, I don't know what sort of airplanes we can buy, just the money is going to be extravagant because, of course, their dad will get on Jeopardy and be amazing. Well, I haven't made it on there yet and probably be not even get the clicker timed up right. But there's something very sweet when kids have great confidence in their father. Well, I need to say something here and don't want to minimize this point at all because it's a very serious point. And there are no doubt many in this room who say, well, that's very sweet. I appreciate hearing about that. And that's not the sort of household I was able to grow up in. And when I hear our father, I think of the worst sort of pain or abuse or addiction or all sorts of dysfunctions and unhealthy sin and difficulties that you can't even imagine. And sadly, that's true. Too many people grew up with distant fathers, abusive fathers, derelict fathers, or because of sin or because of early death, they never really knew their fathers. And so we ought to sympathize with those for whom the very word father stirs up all sorts of conflicted and difficult experiences. And yet, we must always interpret our experiences through the lens of God's Word and not interpret God's Word and constrain what God wants to say about Himself through the lens of our experiences. Certainly, we aren't the first people or the first generation to have difficult father experiences. Surely, I mean, you just have to know the Bible, how messed up many of the, those families were. Certainly, they had bad fathers and dysfunctional households ever since there was sin in the world. And yet, God has, for a very good reason, chosen to reveal Himself in this way. And Jesus has very deliberately instructed us to pray in this way, not because it will necessarily be easy for all of us, but because as painful as some of our home experiences may be, we must seek the redemption of that in our Heavenly Father, in the Father that perhaps we didn't know but should have, or the Father that we won't truly know until we can know Him face to face on the other side of glory. The Father who loves us is the King who reigns over everything. When we say not just our Father, because you have a father, but our father in heaven. That tells us something, that the one to whom we are praying has intimacy and has authority, and both are essential. There is a quotation I read this week from J.I. Packer's book on the Lord's Prayer, and it stopped me in my tracks. Just two short sentences. Here's what he said. The vitality of prayer lies largely in the vision of God that prompts it. Drab thoughts of God make prayer dull. And I can't help but think about my own prayer life. And of course, we all struggle with distractions. We all struggle with discipline at times. So we don't need to beat ourselves up when prayer is hard. It is for most of us. And yet, if prayer is always dull, always boring, 
I have to think, we have to think whether it's because in large part we've lost a sense of to whom we are praying. Think about the people in your life, maybe now or sometime in the past, that you love to pray with. When I think about those men and women, I think about the way that they were, were banging on the gates of heaven, and they prayed with a sense of awe and intimacy toward God, that they were really speaking to someone, and they had a big picture of a God who loved them and could act and who was listening. I love to pray with those sort of people. When our prayers are very dull and very boring, might it be because our conception of God is very dull and boring? If we knew who it was we were talking to, how could we not be eager to converse with Him? Some of you may know I started a a podcast last spring because I needed something else to do. And occasionally I will interview different people. And last week, this is the episode that came out on Wednesday, I interviewed John Piper about his new book on providence. And then we, we talked about books and, and life, and it, it was great fun for me. Now, I didn't have to convince myself to be eager for that conversation. I know John Piper, and he's someone important and interesting and Of course, you would want to talk to him. There was a time in my life very early in ministry, I would have thought, if I could just have a conversation, oh, that would be the thing. Well, it is a very nice thing. I don't know that he's giving the same illustration somewhere about being on Kevin DeYoung's podcast, but be that as it may, I was thinking, how much more, how much a million times more? Should we be eager to talk to God? Think about the whoever would be in your life or your whether, whatever it is, TV, movie, sports, whoever you would love to interview. A million, trillion, infinity times more interesting and important in the universe is God. And we can talk to Him. Drab thoughts of God make prayer dull. So if you feel at a dead end in your prayer life, Don't just self-flagellate, got to pray more. Get a better, truer, bigger, sweeter understanding of God and see what that does to your prayer life. Which brings us finally to the actual petition, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May it be holy. May it be set apart. Hallowed does not mean God's name could be any holier. We are not glorifying God like a microscope, which makes small things look bigger, but glorifying God like a telescope, which brings massively big things into view. To hallow means may all the world, may all created things see God for who He is, and may His human creatures adore and obey Him. As Calvin puts it, we would wish God to have the honor He deserves. Men should never think of Him without the highest reverence. You see, there's a reason that this is the first petition, because it is the one that holds all the others together, puts all the others in focus, puts all the others in their right ordering. Think again, if your children came to you, and they said, all right, we have several requests for you, but here's the first one. And if they said, before we give you any of our requests, we want you to know, here's the very first thing, Dad, that we're asking. We want you to know that we love you, and whatever you do, we want you to be honored. Now, you might think, where are my children? What did you do with them? But if your children truly came and they said, Whatever you do with the rest of our requests, just know that is our bottom line. That's the most important thing, is we want you, parent, to be made much of. We want people to respect and honor you. Well, you are prepared to hear these other requests in the right way. And you, more importantly, in giving them, are prepared to offer them in the right way. May your name be hallowed. The name of God is the sum of all His attributes and works. 
That's why the psalmist says that God has exalted above all things His name and His word. It's why the Old Testament so often speaks of God acting for His name's sake. The Heidelberg Catechism says, hallowed be your name means to bless, worship, and praise you for all your works and for all that shines forth from them, your almighty power, wisdom, kindness, justice, mercy, and truth. And it means help us to direct all our living, what we think, say, and do so that your name will never be blasphemed because of us, but always honored and praised. To pray this prayer is to ask that God would do a miraculous work in our hearts, in our actions, and in our world, that His name would be set apart. It is indicating to God our chief desire, may I praise you, may all the peoples praise you, may the world see you for who you really are. We are not asking that they see God in some pretend way, but rather that they see Him revealed as He really is. I want the world to know what you're really like. God. Again, if you're a parent and you've ever had an experience with a, a teacher or a coach or someone else who's working with your child and maybe they're having to discipline or they're seeing your child struggle and even if they're doing their, their best and not doing anything wrong, isn't there something in you as a parent that you, you want to say, do you know who she really is, especially if, if they are disciplining her or they're, they're having to give bad marks to her in some way. You as a parent want to rush in and say, but you don't know who she really is, what she's really like. Let me tell you. You want people to see your child for what they really are, how you know them, how you love them. Have you ever made some sort of discovery? I don't mean a new planet or something, but a, a movie, a a show, a, a painting, a new restaurant, and you try to tell people about it and they just sort of nod and they're not very interested. You say, no, no, you don't get it. This is amazing. You want people to appreciate all that you have come to appreciate. Or perhaps husbands, if you've ever had the opportunity to speak of your wife and someone is not listening well or someone has a negative view that they formed of her, hopefully, men, you say, no, 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 listen, let me tell you what she's really like. Let me tell you. And, and you don't say that in a way, let me tell you what she's really like. You say, let me tell you. Let me tell you the woman that I married. Let me tell you how beautiful she is. Let me tell you how she cares for me and for the kids. Let me tell you. You don't know what she's like. If you did, you would honor her. And so when we pray, Father, May your name be hallowed in all the earth. We're saying, oh God, may all the peoples praise you. May they know. Start with me in my heart that I would see you for who you are and multiply it around the world. That's what we ask. That's the first thing we ask. But we're going to see again and again in this Lord's Prayer as we reflect on our own lives you can learn a lot about a person by what they pray for. And this request is the one that shapes every other request. This is the petition that supersedes all other petitions. Everything else follows from this supplication. Here's the question that I think God was putting in my head and heart. Kevin, you can put your name there. Is this about my name or your name? That's maybe the most important question as you think about what you're asking in prayer. That's what I need to think about. When I come to God, is it, is it really about my name or His name? Because I don't want to pray about my silly little empires. Yes, cast all our cares on Him, daily bread, we'll get to all of that. But it's not about my name. Is there anything more countercultural than that request? Anything more radical, anything more freeing than to say at the beginning of all your prayers, whether you, you verbalize it or not, it's there in your very spirit of coming before God, that what, over, what, what envelops everything about your prayer is God, Father, 
your name, not my name. To pray that way means glory for God and it means goodness for us. It really does. The two cannot be separated. What is the chief end of man? Notice in the Shorter Catechism, it does not say, what are the two main goals? It is not plural. These are not chief ends. One chief end, absolutely united. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Because the two go together, the happiest life is the one lived for God's glory. So why would we want to pray for anything less? Our Father in heaven, we come before you now at the close of this Lord's day and we simply ask again that your name would be great in our hearts. Your name would be great in our church. Your name would be hallowed in this country. Your name would be seen as precious and beautiful throughout the Muslim world, in Europe, in South America, and in the Far East, and in Africa, Lord, wherever there is human breath, may your name be praised. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen.